Welcome to Unexpected Points. I am your host, Kevin Cole. I am going to talk about a few things today. Julio Jones is top of the news. I'm going to get into Julio's situation, the trade that looks like it's going to happen. At least Julio Jones says he wants it to happen. And the organization does have a lot of reasons for wanting it to happen. I'm going to try to dig into this uh, from some different angles that you might not be hearing a lot of the time. And one of the primary differences of what I'm going to talk about versus some others is how not only this is a cap issue for this year, but also for next year and the long-term effects that we've seen from this step back of cap for different teams, a few of them in particular, including the Falcons because of COVID. Uh, we're also going to get into MVP odds, and I'm going to jump back on Russell Wilson is underrated now that we've seen some of these odds come out. I have some projections for what I believe MVP will be this season. And Russ looks pretty good. Uh, I'm back on team Russ underrated after a short stint on Russ overrated last year. And the last thing that I'm going to talk about here, I'm going to try to potentially make people even more upset who don't normally listen to the pod. <laughs> and this will be a stick to sports segment where I'm going to look at something that's going on in the larger context of news that will hint at, you know, some different concepts when we're looking at probabilities, when we're looking at biases, when we're looking at analytical thinking and how there are mistakes being made there and how we can apply that to sports. And um, as you may or may not have known, if you listened last week to the podcast, I entitled it, you know, somewhat purposefully to be a little inflammatory and say that Dan Campbell uh, is canceled. Now, this is meant to be tongue in cheek. I have no problem with Dan Campbell, DC, Danalytics. I, I love all that stuff. Um, but he spoke out against one of my pet peeves from an analytical standpoint, and that is whether or not you go for it when you're down two touchdowns, you score a touchdown there. Um, so you were down 14, you're down eight after scoring that touchdown. Do you go for two or not? And there's there are a lot of reasons why you want to do that. I explained some of those last week, but the biggest pushback that I got in some comments was the fact that I dismissed his contextual questions about it. You know, what if Aaron Donald is on the other side of the ball? What if, you know, your team's struggling offensively? What if this, what if that? And I probably didn't explain it properly as to why I said those things didn't matter. I'm not, you know, going out like running backs don't matter. Defenses don't matter. Nothing matters. It's not one of those philosophies. What it is, in this circumstance is that the analytical edge is so big that those contextual elements that Campbell's pointing to are not going to be enough under almost any circumstance to make it a better choice to kick the extra point than go for two. And I have some stats that I wanted to just use as an example here, because I was trying to think what's a good analogy, right? Because there are situations in football now where it's accepted the fact that the edge is so big in one direction versus another that you're not going to care about the contextual stuff. And a good example that I found is fourth down. So if it's fourth down and somewhat long, and in this exercise, I'm looking at between fourth and six and fourth and eight. I'm looking over the last three seasons, what has happened in the NFL. So in these situations, as you'd expect, teams pass it the overwhelming amount of time. Um, out of 152 different times teams were in this situation, they only ran the ball seven times. So we're talking about three, 4% of the time. And if you look at that, all of those times were fakes. So all of those times were, were fake punts or fake field goals that teams ended up uh, running the ball in those situations. None of them were your traditional snaps where you end up running it. So I think this is a good example of the same sort of thing I'm talking about, where if you're thinking about context in these situations, I'm sure there are some situations that you're facing a great pass defense, but a terrible run defense. There are some situations where in conjunction with that, your own offensive line is really good at run blocking, not so good at pass blocking. Maybe your left tackle is out who's protecting the quarterback's blind side. Maybe your quarterback is not much of a passer. Uh, all those different circumstances come in. All those different factors are at play every single time, yet coaches chose to pass it in those situations every single time. And quite honestly, they probably could be running it a little bit more often if you really wanted to, to, to label those things out. Maybe it's a bias in the other direction. But the larger point is there are circumstances like this where, you know, getting six yards on the ground, seven yards, eight yards on the ground, it's not an impossibility, right? It can be done just like going for one in these situations. It's like, yeah, you can still win if you go for one and then you go and then you go to overtime. Like it can still work, but the advantage is so high that you'd always go the other way. And that, that's a good example where, 
teams are ignoring context essentially in some of these situations because the edge is so big passing the ball, the ability to convert on a fourth and long, then the ability to convert if on a fourth and long when you were running the ball in, in conjunction of that. So I thought that was a good, uh, a good, a good analogy to use there. And, you know, one thing I'll say to all the Dan Campbell fans out there, uh, while he is canceled and he remains canceled, uh, he w- does have the chance to become, un- to become decanceled, uncanceled. I'm not sure what I'm calling it yet. Uh, and that will be number one, saying something really smart when it comes to strategy, analytics, things like that. So I'm sure that'll happen during the course of the season. Dan Campbell, no doubt is a smart guy, put together a great staff there. That will happen. And number two, you know, maybe I can get some of these guys on the pod, talk to them a little bit, you know, shoot the stuff about uh, two point conversions, about uh, some other analytical concepts. He says he's friendly to these concepts. So I'd love to talk to him about that. Uh, so Dan, just so you know, I'm going to keep the segment of, of cancellation. From now, you still, rem- you still remain canceled, tongue-in-cheek canceled, but in the future, we'll see what ends up happening. What, what happening. But for now, it is still... Sorry, you're canceled. Okay, so let's, let's get right into this Julio stuff. And it's the big, big news of, of the week. Hopefully, by the time this comes out, I'm recording this on a Tuesday in the afternoon. Hopefully, by Wednesday, something hasn't already gone down. But even if it does... Uh, I think this will be very edifying when you're thinking about this situation. A lot of really smart analysts are talking about this. And I think I may have fallen into a similar bucket as a lot of them earlier this off season when I was thinking about the quote unquote, win now mode for the Falcons. And the fact that looking just at their 2021 cap, uh, you could say, you know, you don't have the room now to sign your rookies and that, and that's a problem, but You can potentially restructure Hulu himself. You can restructure uh, Grady Jarrett. And by doing that, you can free up enough cap room this year to sign your rookies. You could still have Julio Jones there. You bring in Kyle Pitts. You have Calvin Ridley. You've locked into Matt Ryan for a longer period of time through a restructure. And this is your your win now window. Uh, The problem with how I thought about it when I was doing this, and I think a lot of people else are thinking about this, is that... We're not thinking about 2022 and the cap situation is not just this one year problem. I think people are saying, you know, the cap last year was a smidge under 200 million, 198.2 million. And then this year it's going to go down to um, 182.5, right? So most people are just thinking about that and they're saying, this is a one season deal. You survive and you get through that, right? Um, But it's really a problem still going out to 2022. Now the, the best estimate we have for what the cap is going to be in 2022 is 203 million. So that is a significant bump up from 182 that we're at now. So that's going to help teams. That's going to give them some breathing room. But the problem is a lot of the things that are going wrong for teams, including the Falcons, these are contracts that were signed pre COVID. So these are contracts that were not signed with the understanding that we would have this cap collapse and then a regrowth but from a lower floor if you think about the long-term trajectory of the cap and let's just look at the fact that over a long period of time it's been growing on an annualized basis by five six percent something like that so if it continued to grow let's say at six percent and covid didn't happen okay so you have the 2020 cap which was like i said a smidge under 200 million if that grew at six percent in 2021, it would have been 210 million. Okay. So this year it's 182 and it would have been 210. So we're talking about 27, 28 million less than what it would have been. So that's a problem. But 2022, yeah, it's going to grow from 182 and a half to maybe let's say 203, 200 in that range, um, 203 maybe on the high end. So it's going to do that. But that's still a lot lower than it would have been if we did not have the COVID regression in the first place. You know, if we went up on our normal 6% per year schedule, 2021 would have been 210 million, which again, just 2021 is going to be, would have been 7 million more than what our projection is for 2022. And then our 2022, if COVID had never happened, that would have been around 223 million. So we're looking at something there where that's 20 million more than what 2022 is going to be. So you combine those two years together, we're talking about almost 50 million dollars that 
is gone from the cap in these two years. And it's not just a one-year deal. Like I said, it's 27 were down this year and about 20 were down next year. So when contracts were signed for Julio Jones, or the extension for Julio Jones, when an extension for Matt Ryan, uh, Deion Jones, uh, Matthews, other guys that are, that are on the Falcons this year, when all of that was happening, the thought in mind was that you weren't going to have these cap issues. We were going to be back in the situation where everyone says the cap doesn't matter. And the large part reason why it doesn't matter is because of this growth that we have seen in the cap through the years, which helped paper over any mistakes that were made here. So think about what the Falcons have done. They, they only have $400,000 in cap space right now. So they have to sign their rookies, which is going to cost them, you know, five, six million dollars. So that's all they have right now. So they can restructure Grady Jarrett and, and make it done, like I said, or they can restructure Julio Jones, but they've already restructured Matt Ryan this offseason, uh, Jake Matthews, and Deion Jones. So they already restructured those three players. And when you look at the savings that they had from there, I think it was something like $14 million from restructuring Matt Ryan. And that's one of the choices that they made is, is sticking with Matt Ryan. And I think a big reason is, there's this weird situation where he has the largest contract. So therefore it makes sense to keep him because you can get the most cap room through restructuring versus cutting or moving on from him. It's a weird situation where it's kind of like the, the, the fact that he's being paid the most makes him the most likely to keep because you can get the most room through restructuring. And remember, they don't have to get player permission to do these restructures because the restructures are basically giving them more money up front, giving them a big signing bonus, which then you're spreading over the remaining life of the contract. So you don't need you don't need permission from players to give them more money up front. I'm sure they'll be perfectly happy with getting more money up front. So they got about 14 million from Ryan. They got another, I think it was four million from Jones. They got another seven million, something like that, from Matthews. So you add all these together, and they're already freed up, you know, 20 something million in cap space, and they still don't really have any room here. So I think you have to look at the fact that that is just for this season. But when you look at next season, as of right now, the Falcons only have about $6 million in cap next year. And that assumes, you know, they're not bringing in any free agents. They're not doing anything fancy here. It does assume that the fifth-year option will be exercised for Ridley, a guy who they're going to need to extend. Um, but that's just what's going to happen because of the fact that they've already made these restructures. So this is what happens. Um, 2022, like I said, the cap is a depressed year when you restructure for more cap room in 2021, or if you're going to continue to restructure, like people want them to do for Grady Jarrett, you're pushing more of that cap into 2022, which is another difficult year. And that's, what's brought that down to a level where they really don't have any other room in 2022. So if they want to restructure, uh, Jarrett or Julio Jones and keep Julio Jones, they're not going to they're going to be in this whole mess again and continuing to push things further and further into the future which makes it extremely extremely difficult. So I think what happened from the Falcons perspective is remember we have a new GM here. It was um it was uh Terry Fontenot taking over. So Fontenot took over for Dimitrov and he had to look at from a broad perspective here. They had the number 4 pick now, what were they going to do with the number four pick? I think it's easy for some of us to say, well, they could have taken a quarterback. They could have started the rebuild. Um, but the situation here is tricky because they can't get out of any of these contracts. They couldn't really kickstart a rebuild. They couldn't cut a lot of players. They couldn't trade a lot of players because of the huge cap ramifications and negative cap ramifications of doing so. So I think that would have been difficult. And number two, more importantly, you know, maybe they didn't like any of the quarterbacks who were near the top who would have been left. You know, they cheered when Trey Lance was taken and then they were going to get Kyle Pitts. Maybe they didn't think Trey Lance was worth that number four overall pick. We really don't know who else would have thought that of Trey Lance if it wasn't for the fact that the 49ers went up there into the third pick. Obviously, they didn't think that um, that Justin Fields or Mac Jones were worth it. And a lot of other teams didn't. I mean, you know, obviously we saw um, we saw Fields fall down to to the to the 12th pick, we saw um, Mac Jones not go until the 15th, I'm sorry, the 11th pick and Mac Jones not go to the 15th pick. So a lot of teams didn't like those guys. And they saw Kyle Pitts there, who they probably had rated at, you know, one of the highest grades they've ever, they've ever gotten. They decided not to trade back and bring in extra picks, which I think could have been a mistake. But anyway, they thought Pitts was that guy. 
So this might not have been like we're in win now mode. We need to press everything forward. It might have been this is just the most prudent way to go about things for our franchise. We don't like our quarterback pick selections, potential selections at four. We don't like um, the idea of keeping around everyone. Uh, we need to restructure some people for this year. So who is going to be the person who's left out of that? And the situation probably came down to saying, if we don't like a quarterback, then we have to keep Matt Ryan or else the whole thing falls apart. We got these big contracts on everyone else out, everyone else. We can't do a 2016 style rebuild like the Browns did or a 2019 style Dolphins rebuild where we let everyone go. We're just not in that situation. So we have to keep Ryan. We can use him to restructure. So then once they felt, felt like that was, that was the way to go. Once you do that, then you have to look at your other contracts and you say, we have Jake Matthews, who's got eight seasons under his belt. Uh, we got Deion Jones, who's got six seasons under his belt. And then we have Julio Jones, who's 32 years old, 11 seasons, right? He's played significantly longer. And they have Calvin Ridley coming up. Calvin Ridley is a guy that they are going to need to probably extend after this season, if not now, if they want to free it. But they can't really free up that much cap room this season. So they'll probably do it uh, before the fifth-year option going into next season. So they looked at this and they said, you know, Julio's the oldest guy. We have Pitts coming in. We have Calvin Ridley. We have enough there from an offensive standpoint. We're going to be paying Matt Ryan just an insane amount as far as a cap hit going forward after this restructure. You know, he's up into the 40 millions, right? Uh, well above 40 million, well above 45 million some of these some of these years. So to say we're going to pay him 45, we're going to pay Julio another you know, $20 million cap hit next year. We're going to then re restructure, I mean, uh, extend Ridley, which he'll be making probably $20 million a year. That's probably just too much for them to be paying at those skill positions and not have anything else. So they decided let's stick with the left tackle. Let's the younger left tackle. Let's stick with the younger linebacker. Um, and let's stick with Matt Ryan because we don't know when we're going to have that quarterback and we're not going to start over at quarterback. And that was the route they, they chose. So I think it can make sense when you think about it from those perspectives. And the perspective is really that they have to do something with Julio Jones. They're going to save that $15 million salary this year if they're able to trade him. They're going to save money next year and going forward. Yes, they have to wait until June 1st, but that's what they kind of have to do. Now, the problem with it, and I think this, this issue is softening a little bit, but I thought the biggest problem with making this trade was going to be that the optics were going to be really, really bad when they're not able to get that much for Julio. I think Falcons fans, maybe even casuals out there who were thinking about this, or even you know non-casuals who were thinking about this, are probably looking at it and saying, hey, Julio Jones is a stud. This is a first-round picks sort of guy. This is a Hall of Famer. Look at what Mo Sanu got a couple of years ago, which everyone's going to talk about. Look at what uh, Amari Cooper got during the middle of the season. He got a first round pick a while back. Uh, I don't care that he's older. He is going to be one of those players that you're going to get a first round pick for. The actuality is not only do we have the normal issues. So let's talk about the normal issues, non-COVID cap issues. So the normal issues with Julio Jones, 32 years old. I looked at a bunch of different receivers and to try to figure out who are the guys who've been able to put up huge numbers beyond their their 32nd year in the league right just looking at the guys and saying who are the guys who could continue to perform I'm looking over the era that we've been tracking stats for the last 15 years and it's really Terrell Owens did that he put up he put up a couple of huge seasons but beyond that uh, Larry Fitzgerald has done okay but he hasn't been at the highest level Andre Johnson has one big season that he had um, after the age 32, but then he went, went to the Colts and he kind of fell off a cliff there. He's a similar player to, I would say, to, to Julio Jones. I mean, Julio Jones is on a, on a higher level than these guys, but these are just other guys who have done well. Steve Smith had one great year. So a lot of players had one great year. Now to get multiple great years beyond the age of 32, it's a, it's a low probability thing. It is something that Terrell Owens was able to do, but he's really the only example of a guy in recent history, who's been doing that for multiple seasons. And he was a freak, you know, he was doing it up until age 35 pretty well. So there's that, the age concern. Now, the second thing is the injury concern. A lot of people have said, maybe the reason you want to trade Julio now is you want to trade him a year early, early instead of a year late. The problem is it's already a year late. And the thing is for Julio is that he, you know, he missed time last year. 
And I think that becomes a big problem for, for some people. I mean, let's just look up his history here. So he really has almost played every single game that he's had the ability to play. He missed a couple of games in 2016, and then he only played nine games last year. So that was a big problem because not only does he have the age concerns, but he has the injury concern of actually missing games. And then of course, he has, you know, lingering issues. He's had soft tissue inju- injuries when it comes to um, hamstrings, other things like that. He's had the foot injury. He broke his foot before uh, in the off season, before he came into the NFL, he broke his foot again in 2013, which caused him to uh, miss everything. He broke it during the fifth game of the season. So he missed the entire season there. And he's been managed pretty heavily when it comes to practice time. And I think guys who have, you know, had Julio Jones in fantasy know that it wasn't hundred percent. You didn't know sometimes whether he was going to be a decoy or not. Now he's gutted through a lot of those, a lot of that play and a lot of those injuries. But if you bring him into the fold, it's no guarantee you're going to get full seasons out of him, despite the fact that he did play many full seasons in a row before last year. But I think there may be a little bit of a prove it element to Julio this year where they want people want to see him get healthy first and then his value will go up quite a bit. So that's that's number one. And then number two, we're bringing back in the, the COVID issues that I'm talking about with the cap. The number of teams that not only have the cap room this year to pay for him and pay for an older player and give up trade compensation, the number of teams who have that much room and room next season also, because if they have to restructure guys to fit Julio in this season, they're going to be in some problems next season because of, because of contracts. So you're going to see a lot of teams that have rookie contracts on their quarterback, and that's how they have room, or they're not really competing. Uh, the teams that don't really need space, the Jags and the Jets, don't think competition is going to be a big thing there. Julio supposedly wants to play for a winner, so I don't know about that. The Broncos, yeah, uh, they have the cap space there because they don't have the quarterback issues, and they have a lot of young players who are not on their second contract yet, like Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy and Noah Fant and people on the, the offensive line there. I mean, on the offense there, but they're pretty stacked, honestly. You know, they have KJ Hamler that they brought into. These guys aren't superstars on the level that Julio is, of course, but they have a lot of young players that, that they have there. Uh, they drafted Seth Williams in this last draft. I mean, is later on, so I don't expect too much from them, but still, they got a, a lot of depth in that area. Like I mentioned, Noah Fant, too, at, at tight end, who they drafted in the first round a couple of years ago. They don't really have a quarterback either. So it's kind of a weird situation where you're bringing in Julio and you don't necessarily have the quarterback that you're supporting there. So you could be looking at other areas. So I'm not sure about the Broncos. And of course they're in this Aaron Rodgers talk and that they may may rather just keep their cap free for, for that. Uh, We have the lions team needs a lot of help at receiver, but can't think of a worse team as far as, in the rebuilding cycle, do you want Julio Jones in this situation at this part of the rebuilding cycle? Pr- pretty, pretty low chance there. The Chargers. Now for the Chargers, it's interesting. You have Mike Williams where he's playing on his fifth year option this year. So I could see they let him go. Uh, they drafted Josh Palmer. So maybe he can step in and do something there. They have Keenan Allen, who's not the, the youngest guy. And they have Herbert and they have him on that, 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 young, that low deal. So I think they're a definite option. They're a definite real option. The 49ers is another one that was mentioned. If they let Garoppolo go, that'll give them plenty of cap room there to do what they want to do. But, you know, they have Debo Samuel. They have Brandon Ayuk, who looked good. They have um, George Kittle. And probably not going to compete for a championship with Trey Lance, where they decide to just turn things over to the rookie. I mean, weirder things can happen, but you don't see rookies go that far into the playoffs almost ever. So is Julio still going to be healthy and still be productive at the time where Lance is really hitting his peak and you're giving up assets for him after trading away your first round pick in the next two drafts during that time. So not, not ideal there. Um, I'm interested in the, potential for the Titans to maybe go for him. Um, so I think there are two different teams I think are I think are the most likely. One being the Titans. Now the Titans do not have the cap space this year. They only have about f- three and a half million right now in space. They need to sign their rookies, which as I said is going to cost five, six million. And Julio's contract post June 1st, when it comes over, it has 15 million guaranteed for this year. Another it's going to cost only 11 for the next two seasons and only 2 million guaranteed next year. 
So you don't have many guarantees going forward, but it is it is 15 million here. Um, now the thing is with with the Titans, you don't they have 20 million in cap space next year. So I think they can figure out some restructuring that they can do. Uh, I'm looking through their contracts. It looks like Rashawn Evans is the one guy who's going to need to be extended if they want to keep him around. So he's going to be a problem in 2022 as far as adding to the cap. Uh, the rest of their core will still be there. And another reason that I think that they are really interesting, the Titans are really interesting, is because generally this time of the offseason is not great for a trade, for trade value, because teams have gone through free agency, they've gone through the draft, and this is the best that your team is going to look on paper as far as what they're going to be able to, to produce next year. Um, you know, a lot of these plans are going to fall apart. A lot of plan A that teams have for what they're going to do is going to fall apart. But as of now, when you look at a team, let's say the a couple of teams that have been discussed for Julio. So let's say um, the Patriots, right? The Patriots bring in Hunter Henry. The Patriots bring in Jonu Smith. The Patriots brought in Kendrick Bourne. The Patriots brought in Nelson Aguilar. Now, are all these guys going to work out? Probably not. But as of now, you're kind of hoping that's going to happen. And your willingness to get rid of a lot as far as in draft capital to bring in an older receiver like Julio, it's at its lowest right now because you just went through that cycle. The Ravens are another team that we talked about. The Ravens brought in Sammy Watkins in free agency. The Ravens drafted Rashad Bateman in the first round. The Ravens drafted um, Tylon, uh, Tylon Wallace in the um, fourth round. You know, they brought in bodies. That's three bodies that they brought in there at wide receiver. Again, they're going to be much less likely. And supposedly they had conversations with the Falcons earlier this offseason. They're going to be much less likely to want to make a deal right now than they would be potentially later on in the season when they figure out which one of these guys aren't working out. And I think that's when you compare it to the most Sanu trade where it was like a desperate Brady and Belichick was a little bit desperate at that point. They're making a playoff push. They had nothing at wide receiver and they were willing to give up that second round pick in order to get Mo Sanu, a younger Mo Sanu, but you know, Muhammad Sanu was not Julio Jones. Uh, same thing with the Amari Cooper trade. Cooper trade. It was midseason. The Cowboys really needed this to make their playoff push. So they decided to give up a little bit more. You're just not going to get that same trade compensation right now. It's going to be more similar to what we saw with DeAndre Hopkins, where they only got a second round pick for him because it was difficult at that point in time to make a deal in the offseason where a lot of teams feel like they're in a good position. The Titans, after free agency, after the draft, they still can't feel like they're, they're in a good position. Um, with their receivers. Think about it. John New Smith left. So what do you have? It, even at tight end, they have Ferkser, Anthony Ferkser, and, and Jeff Swain. That's that's their two guys there. Not so great. At receiver, now this is when it really becomes an issue. We talk AJ Brown, stud, uh, not making much money there. They brought in Josh Reynolds. So they did bring in someone when Corey Davis left. But other than that, it's a lot of names who have not done much at all. You have Nick Westbrook, who I think was a practice squad addition. They signed up someone else's practice squad. You have Chester Rogers, Cameron Batson, Mason Kinsey, Cody Hollister. They drafted Des Fitzpatrick, but again, you know, these, these later day three type of draft picks are not necessarily going to do anything. Fred Brown, Marcus Johnson. I don't even know who these guys are. Never heard of them before. Um, and that is their receiving core. So if you lose AJ Brown, you know, your season's kind of looking pretty rough. I don't know if it's looking over, but it's looking rough. You have Josh Reynolds and a bunch of bodies out there. So the Titans really do need to bring in some people here. They are competing. They are a team that looks like they need a little bit of a bump this season to get them to be a favorite in their division for the Colts, but they're, they're pretty close to the Colts there. Ryan Tannehill, you know, he's he's going into his mid 30s now. They need to give him everything they they can they can give him. He has looked like the guy. So if they wanted to restructure him and push some more money into the future, I think that's fine now. I think they feel good about attaching themselves to Ryan Tannehill very heavily. Or if they want to extend him even and and really clear out some cap space for the next two years. That's also a possibility. I don't think is out of the the realm of possibility because Tannehill has really proven himself. I mean, he only had that like half a season before they extended him last time. Now he's got 
uh, you know, more backing. He had a, another couple of successful years. So they are really the team that needs someone in a state of the NFL right now, a state of the NFL offseason where not a lot of teams need people. And that's why I think the Tennessee Titans are the number one team for getting Julio Jones right now. Okay, so uh, before I go on to the next topic of MVP and what's going on, my thoughts about Russell Wilson, I just want to tell you that if you enjoy the content here, you enjoy the content with other PFF podcasts, please check them out. We have a whole bunch of them. Obviously, have the NFL podcast with Sam and Steve, which has been doing extremely well, growing like crazy there. Two for one drafts with Austin Gale and uh, Mike Renner, which has been the go-to resource during draft season, which is now going to continue to be good looking at these rookies as they go into the NFL right now. You have the PFF forecast with George and Eric, where they're doing a lot of off-season, some similar betting stuff to what I'm talking about here, but in more depth there. They've been doing it for a while. Eric's the one who created a lot of our green line process for looking at, at different player props and betting. Um, great resource there. And then, of course, uh, the boss man, Chris Collinsworth, with Richard Sherman and his off-season podcast, where he gets some of the greatest interviews out there. So I want everyone to go ahead and check that out. Okay, let's get into MVP. So I went, you know, offensive rookie of the year a couple of weeks ago. I looked at defensive rookie of the year last year, last week. This week, I'm looking at an MVP. And I think when we're talking about quarterbacks, they are steadier performers than any other position. In other words, I believe there is the ability to exploit year-over-year fluctuations in opinion based on the recency of what just happened in order to find value. Now, last season, in the offseason, Timo Riske is another uh, analyst that we have in our research and development department. He and I put together an analysis where we used some statistical analysis. I don't want to get into the whole Bayesian updating and everything that we did, but essentially we looked at past performance of quarterbacks based upon their PFF grades and their efficiency by expected points added per play, which is our preferred metric for looking at efficiency of quarterbacks. So we looked at those going trailing back in history. We update expectations for players over time, and we want to be able to properly weigh what just happened versus what you've seen in the past. And because of that, last season, uh, in our off-season article, and you guys can, can check it out, it is on the MVP article, I believe it's under Timo's name, where it has Matt Ryan and Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees in the title. And the reason it had those guys in the title is because those were the players we identified last season as being the biggest values at MVP. Aaron Rodgers ended up hitting, so that, so that was good. But again, everything is risk-reward here. This is not like we just like Aaron Rodgers in a vacuum. We liked Aaron Rodgers last year, despite him struggling for several years from a perspective of efficiency and not being a top three guy really in grading either during uh, 2015, 2017, 2018, and 2019. The reason we liked him was because he was 33 to one, okay, in his odds at, at DraftKings. I'm going to quote DraftKings here uh, last summer. That's the reason we liked him. And Matt Ryan was 50 to one. And uh, Drew Brees last year, let me look up what Drew Brees was at. Drew Brees was 25 to one. So these are guys who had performed well. Maybe they had a little bit of a down 2019 so it wasn't so great heading into 2020 but we said hey these are guys with established track records for a long time and we're underrating them based upon what has happened in this last season and that ends up being a problem um and then you know we said to fade guys one of them josh allen who did really well but we said to fade guys who are getting a huge boost and that was kyler murray josh allen um dak prescott some others who were thought of as being um, Lamar Jackson, who because of what happened in 2019, were getting huge boosts or their expectations and in, in what the leap they would make in 2020 were getting huge boosts there. Now we almost got killed with, with Josh Allen, of course, who was 50 to one last year. And we thought he wasn't a value there, but luckily that, that, that did not end up happening for us. And Aaron Rodgers did end up hitting. So let's look at what's happening this year with the MVP market, because things have shifted a lot. 
Haven't shifted that much at the very top. Patrick Mahomes was uh, four to one last year, which let's talk about this in implied probabilities because I think that's an easier way of digesting this information. So his implied probability was in that circumstance is he has a 20% chance to win. So if his actual probability you believe his actual chance of winning is higher than 20%, it would be a profitable bet at plus 400 and vice versa. If you think it's under 20%, you wouldn't want to bet at, at plus 400. Now this year he's plus 450, which is kind of interesting because now his implied probability is down to 18.2%. And if you look at what we thought about um, Mahomes last year, so our implied probability for Mahomes, let me just get this in here, was we projected he had a 28% last year, even though the, the implied odds were 20%. So we liked him, not as a huge advantage like you would have gotten on, on Aaron Rodgers, who we said had about a 6.5% impl- a probability of winning versus his 3.2% implied probability. So we, we, set, we had a lot more uh, positive expected value there. It was about doubling your money expected value. For Mahomes, not quite as much, but I would think that this season, he's probably pretty close to that 28% expectation for us. So the fact that he's priced at 18 looks pretty good. I mean, he just, he didn't win last year, but he's shown that he's in there in that top two or top three every single season. When you can do that, that's really, really valuable when the odds are giving you a one in five chance of, of winning. So we'll step down and the, the guy with the second highest odds this year is Aaron Rodgers plus 900, which is a 10% implied probability. Last year, he was, like I said, he was 2.9%. Now he's up to 10%. That is a huge jump. And I don't think there's any way that he justifies that. I know that he had the great 2020, but he did struggle for several years before that. He's 38 years old, all that sort of stuff. Um, probably going to end up fading that there. Third in implied probability this year is Josh Allen, 8.3%, which is plus 1,100. He was at 2% last year. Uh, We don't think this is as egregious, but still overpriced. And you just can't ignore what he did in 2018, 2019, and 2020. It just wasn't that good. You know, flat out was not that good. Uh, I mean, sorry, not 2020. In 2018 and 2019. Just was not good. So he has one good season. He has a couple of poor seasons. You mix that all together. You give more weighting to 2020, of course. Um, You hope that he establishes a new plateau based upon what he did there. But I think some regression is in store for him here. Tom Brady is next. 6.3% probability versus 5.9 last year. Let me see. For Tom Brady last year, we had him at a 3.8% probability. It's about the same this season. so, So not too much of a change. Huge jump for Matthew Stafford this year, which is strange because he hadn't done anything. He's just gone to the Rams. He's also at 6.3% implied probability, uh, plus 1,500. So he is fifth in MVP odds versus he was 50 to one last year. Now, some of this is the fact that he's just going to win more games. And that's important. You almost have to win really 12 games, I would say, in a 17-game schedule. But at least, I mean, at least 11 games probably more like 12 games and probably more like 13 games, honestly, to, to win the MVP award. So he has a much better chance of doing that, obviously, with the Rams than he did with the Lions. But, I mean, this is a guy who's never even gotten a Pro Bowl berth, let alone an MVP vote, let alone an All-Pro, first-team or second-team All-Pro. He's never gone to the Pro Bowl. Matthew Stafford, a lot of years, not so hot. Um, and then next, and this is where we're finally getting to Russell Wilson, uh, next here. So tied for sixth in odds are Russell Wilson and Lamar Jackson, 5.9% implied probability. What's really interesting about that. And this is what I want to look at the contrast between 2020 and 2021 last year, Lamar Jackson was second in implied probability at 14.3%. Now he's 5.9. Russell Wilson was third at 12.5%. And now he's 5.9. That's a huge drop for these guys. And did Russell Wilson like have a that bad of a year last year? I mean, I kind of get Lamar Jackson's drop because he was so pumped up after having been the unanimous MVP the year before. Uh, in fact, when we calculated the numbers for him, we thought he only had about a 5.7% chance last year. And his implied probability, like I mentioned, was at 12 point, I'm sorry, 14.3%. So we thought that was way, way too high. 
Um, but for Wilson, we had his projected probability last year at 11.4%. And like I said, he was 12.5. So not that far off. Now he's down to 5.9. Now his implied probability is going to drop this year because of two different factors. One, he didn't play at the highest level last year, but he was still, you know, a top five guy by PFF grade. EPA, not, not so hot though. He was more like 10th, 11th in EPA per play. So that's going to hurt. Um, so that's number one. Number two, more competition. Uh, guys like Aaron Rodgers, Josh Allen, and Tom Brady have moved up even in our relative standing. So when all of that happens, it's going to make it difficult. And Justin Herbert's another guy who's gone up a lot. Um, it's going to make it difficult for Russ to have the same chance when you're fighting against even more people to win. But was what happened last year enough to drop Russ from our calculation of 11.4% probability to below 6%, which is where he is at now. And, you know, I don't think so. And if we dig a little bit into what's going on with Russ, I think it's not only the recency bias of last year and people's thoughts about last year, but it's really what he did in the second half of the season. I mean, when you dig into the first half of the season, and I know this well because I said Russ was – slightly overrated going into the season. And I was in a world of pain the first half of the season because he was doing so well, you know, through week eight, he was number one in PFF grade. He was trouncing the competition in MVP implied probability. He had implied probability after week eight to win the MVP at 65%. So that's a huge, huge number. Okay. Um, that's a, you know, he was, he was minus money at that point. Uh, and then if you think about later on, he started to fall, he started to fall, he started to fall. But I think it was even through week 12 or week 13, he was right there still in the MVP race with a significant number, uh, but he just fell off those last few seasons. So I think there's a problem here where people are looking at his second half of the season, they're weighing that extremely heavily and they're discounting the first half of the season and they're kind of discounting going back multiple seasons too, thinking that it's all over for let Russ cook, even though he had a, he had the third highest probability going into last year. And we didn't know that he was going to be cooking last year. Um, but when you look at projecting out for the next season, the second half of the season is more predictive than the first half of the season slightly. Right. So that is true, but the full season using that larger sample is much, much more predictive than either using the first half or the second half. So let's not ignore what he did in the first half. If we take the full season, like I said, he was a top five guy in grade. He was still top 10 in EPA per play. His relative standing has fallen some, but he still is right there amongst the top quarterbacks. And the fact that he's tied for sixth in MVP odds when most people thought he was almost a 1B to Patrick Mahomes' 1A going into last season. The fact that he's only ever so slightly higher than Dak Prescott. Uh, not that much higher, about 1% implied probability difference between him and Kyler Murray, between Justin Herbert. That seems off to me. And I know they have a lower chance of winning their division because of the new competition that they have there. But if they pull that off, this could finally be the year that everyone's talked about where Russ you know, not only gets an MVP vote, but could win that MVP. And he is underrated and undervalued right now because there's this thought that that offense was figured out in the second half of last season. And if someone comes to me and says, there's been a fundamental change and someone's been figured out 10 years into their career, I'm going to fade that. I'm going to fade the thought that a player is now different, that teams have figured out how to play someone after 10 years when they still have the same ability. I didn't see any, any lower ability from him as far as accuracy and his scrambling ability. They still have excellent receivers in Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf can even take his game to another level this year. And they bring in the Rams Rams offense, according offensive coordinator from the Rams who everyone loves, you know, Matthew Stafford, Matthew Stafford and his zero pro bowls has a higher um, implied probability to win the MVP than Russell Wilson. That seems like a travesty to me, and I don't get how it can be possible. All right, before we move on to our last segment, our stick to sports segment, I want to let you know about Western and Southern Group. They are our sponsor. They are a life insurer, and 
I know for me, and I've discussed this before, I got a couple of kids, you got obligations, you got a house, you got other things. Life insurance is something that you have to think about, not only for your own peace of mind, but for that of your family. However difficult these questions may be, Western and Southern can help you answer them. Uh, it's backed by over 130 years of experience. Western and Southern Group, life insurance, retirement, and investments. This is a compensated endorser of products issued by member companies of Western and Southern Financial Group, Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, so what I wanted to do here was to figure out a way to look at something that's going on beyond the sporting wheel world, especially in times of the off season where we don't have as much to talk about and figure out what we should do. Um, and again, another ton in cheek suggestion here where I'm calling this segment, stick to sports. Stick to sports, stick to sports. Stick to sports. Okay, so for this segment, what I wanna talk about here is an article that some people may have seen that talked about a controversy that happened with the game show Jeopardy. And there was an article that got a lot of play by Ben Smith over at the New York Times. And the inflammatory title of the article says, I'll take white supremacist hand gestures for 1,000. And the subtitle here is how hundreds of Jeopardy contestants talk themselves into a baseless conspiracy theory and won't be talked out of it. So I thought this was interesting for a few different reasons. One is if you dig into the details of what went on here, I think there are three main biases that people fell into with this, with this situation. And I'll talk about them um, in order of importance um, not understanding conditional probabilities, not understanding selection bias, not understanding really confirmation bias there. So all of these come into play in this story. And number two, I think it shows that traditionally when we talk about conspiracy theories, there's the thought of, you know, person with the tinfoil hat, um, people that maybe don't have the highest education level, people highly influenced. These were objectively some of the most knowledgeable people in the world who had been past winners or past contestants with Jeopardy. So they should, you would think that knowledge would equal more understanding and less likelihood of being able to synthesize this information correctly and falling down a conspiracy theory type of path. But the reality is we're all victim to a lot of these biases and I'm gonna talk about it. So here's the background here. So the background is that there was a contestant who was on Jeopardy, Kelly Donahue. And this poor guy, he won three times, I believe. So after he had already won three times and he was being introduced, he flashed for the camera as part of the introductions, the three, the number, the number three. And he did this in a way where maybe it's a little bit untraditional. He did not use the pinky and the thumb claps together with the three like this he used the three like this and he had it against his chest like this. So he had the, he had the, the, the ring through the pinky finger out and then the other fingers in. Now there's this thing that that's going on for people who are too on the internet and have had their brain fried like I have, um, where you're seeing something where this has been co-opted supposedly by white supremacists. I didn't even understand why until I looked into this a little bit more. And supposedly if you look at it from a certain angle, it can be WP for white power and so on and so forth. So there's a lot, there've been things that have been shared about people using this supposedly as a wink and nod in this sort of manner. Now, some people in a Jeopardy Facebook group of former contestants and you know nothing good happens in a Facebook group. We all know that. Uh, so Jeopardy Facebook group, they saw this, they saw that there were some complaints about it on Twitter and they started exchanging information with each other about the fact that this, was this a white supremacist sign? They looked on his personal information for him. They found that he was a Trump supporter. So then they jumped to the conclusion there that that made him very likely that this was something that was going on. And at the very least, they felt like Jeopardy should have edited this out because it was something that some people could take the wrong way. Um, so first I wanna go into the selection bias issue of it. And this is kind of like a social media thing too with, with the selection bias. So the thing is we, whether we like to believe it or not, and no matter which side what someone's on, I'm gonna both sides things here, which I know people love. Uh, we are getting 
a selection of information that is not representative of the truth. I mean, there is no tr quote unquote truth out there, right? So presumably the people in this Jeopardy group, especially the ones who started the complaints about this and sent it on, presumably they fell into a certain type of political mindset. They're seeing things online. And when you see things online, you're going to be more familiar with the worst opinions and actions of the people in the out group, the people that you're not a part of. So I think there can be a misunderstanding for how common these things are, right? If any time someone who's not in your political group does something bad, you see it and you don't see anything that they do well because no one is incentivized and you're in your group to share something that's positive about another group, then you're going to assume they commit um, bad actions much more often than they actually do. And you're not going to assume they do things that you agree with very often at all because you only see the worst of what people do uh, in, in the out group. So for that reason, a lot of these former contestants, I think, thought this is like a bigger phenomenon than what it is because through social media, they're seeing these incidents that are being shared and they think it's a big deal. And it's, it's possible that people on the on let's say the more liberal side of the spectrum who would be against this, it's possible that they may even be more aware of this phenomenon than people on the more conservative side of things because conservatives are not sharing amongst themselves questionable incidents of white supremacist hand signals as much as, as liberals are. So then you have, you have that, that problem where you're, you're overestimating not only whether it's true or not, you're overestimating whether or not the audience knows about this. Because I think there was concern there where they said that the, the audience could be subjected to seeing this and, you know, harmed by, by seeing this symbol. And they talked about there were 50 tweets roughly that were out there. You know, 50 tweets out of an audience for Jeopardy of about 10 million people. So we're talking about a 0.00005% of the audience had tweeted about it. But because you're seeing things on social media, you're seeing things shared within your circle, you have, a, you have, a, you have this selection bias, you have a much bigger uh, thought of how big a phenomenon it is versus what it really is. So that's number one, what people don't know. And everyone needs to know that. And this goes into, like I said, a lot of football discussions here. If you're on the analytical side of things, if you're on the football guide side of things, you're going to see people dunking on the other side. And so you're going to see the worst of everyone's opinion on the other side. You're going to get impressions of people who you don't agree with on some things. You're going to get an impression that all of their opinions are the worst because those are the only ones that you're being shared. So I think that's, that's part of it. Uh, the second thing, confirmation bias. So once people have in their head that they believe because they believe there's a higher chance of what they saw being something bad because of this selection bias, because what they've been exposed to, they believe that when they find out that when they start digging into this guy's profile, they start looking for things. And this comes up with a lot of different conspiracy theories is you have the theory first and then you go find the evidence next. And I think this is, this is again, something you can't do an analysis. I mean, just to go back to my defensive player of the year analysis, I originally wrote it up like I was going to be writing about Jalen Phillips being my pick, value pick for defensive player of the year. But I looked I mean, defensive rookie of the year, excuse me. But I looked more and more into it and I realized how hard it is for someone who's not elite, elite, top five pick edge player to win that award. And that backed me off of it. And I ended up going with Micah Parsons at, at the end. So you have to let the evidence, treat the evidence where you're not, you're not confirming what you're doing here. So there's a big dose of confirmation bias here. People went into his profile. They looked and found, like I said, that he's wearing a, a Donald Trump make America great again hat. They found some other pictures where people were doing, you know, doing three like that. And they were wondering, is this something? So again, you can always find something if you're willing to dig and let it confirm as much as, as possible. Uh, but I think the biggest problem with this, and this comes up a lot, is people's thinking on conspiracy theories about conditional probability. Now, it's not to say that these things cannot be true, right? So it is possible. There are some things that are once considered a conspiracy theory. I think we're seeing it now with the potential for there to have been a leak of uh, an accidental leak of uh, the Wuhan lab for coronavirus. That's become something that's more plausible now, where once it was labeled a conspiracy theory. So it's definitely possible, but we have to think about this in, in a rational way. So we don't want to have the binary thinking about things, right? We don't want to say, Let's, let's look at everything as one piece. Let's say we saw this thing that we believe is, is very much likely to be a 
a racist symbol. We saw that this guy's a Trump supporter. And then everything else, you're just going to look at it one binary thing and say, am I leaning towards he did it or he didn't? And once I'm leaning towards that he did do it, I'm just going to assume everything falls into place. What happens is there's really more conditional probabilities here, right? So number one, even if you know that he's a Trump supporter, like what's the likelihood that a Trump supporter knows what this is? Straight up. Um, what's the probability that then knowing what it is, they would do some sort of winking signal on television. Uh, and then even more importantly, what's the probability they would be doing this because they had won Jeopardy three straight times. They had to have won three straight times to have gotten to this. After he won once, he did the one. After he won twice, he did the two. And then after he won again, he did the, th he did the three for the third one. So what's the probability all of these things start to come together? So even if you think there's an oversized probability of all these things because of that selection bias that we mentioned earlier, once you start doing the conditional probability on this, it gets lower and lower and lower. Even if you think all these things, let's say, had a 50% chance, which is pretty high, you know, if you get 50% chance and then this other thing has 50% chance, now you're down to 25. And then another thing, then you're down to 12 and a half. And then another thing, and then now you're down to six and a quarter and so on. And it gets lower and lower as these things string together. And that's when you realize the probability that all of these things align is very, very small. And that's what you have to think about. Um, different things happening when it comes to statistical thinking is it's not just one primary, am I leaning this way or am I leaning that way? You have to string together all of these different incidents to figure out that they could all come in and to make a plausible situation. And that's the problem with what happened here, especially with people who we think are knowledgeable, is they can be fooled by not understanding conditional probability, not understanding selection bias, not understanding confirmation bias. All those things together, we probably get into a lot more problems. Uh, a lot less, sorry, a lot fewer problems with each other if we understood all those things and took a step back and tried to understand our own biases. All right, that was the maybe never to be seen again. We'll see, stick to sports segment. I appreciate everyone tuning in here. Please rate and review the pod on iTunes. And as we're getting into the summer months, I may start taking some questions as we go through this, although I've been surprisingly able to find a lot of material here. But I wanna thank everyone for tuning in and I'll be talking at you again next week. Thanks so much.